Hello, my name is Barbara Kohn. I'm the director of the Austrian Economic Center and we are discussing Karl Menger, the greatest economist today. Uh, with me, I have Dr. Mark Skousen, uh, who is a financial economist, a uh, university professor and the author of more than 25 books on economics, personal finance and investing. Uh, Mark's works include economic logic, Mar uh, the, Marxism, the maxims of Wall Street, a Viennese waltz down to Wall Street, as you know, he's a truly Austrian economist, the making of modern econom economics, and uh, the completed autobi autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Mark writes as, uh, as an award-winning financial newsletter, forecasts and strategies. He produces the annual Free Mark, uh, Freedom Fest conference, uh, which this year will, next year actually will be held in Las Vegas again. And he's a presidential fellow at Chapman University. Uh, he has been a contributor to the Wall Street Journal, CNBC's uh, Santelli Exchange, Forbes magazine, and Investment U. He was recently named one of the top 20 most influential living economists. Based on his work, The Structure of Production, the federal government now publishes gross output the first macro measure of the uh, economy in the 1940s. But before we go into detail with Mark, I would simply point out what we have just published prior to the uh, 10th Austrian Economics Conference. This is our book, Karl Menger. As you know, we have 150 years of uh, anniversary this year. This was published by the Hayek Institute with uh, contributions of great uh, thinkers and authors and uh, economists this year. And then the outcome, this is what Mark will be presenting in his, in his paper, is the huge fat work of uh, the Austrian Economics Conference that was just held at, um, at the Austrian Central Bank uh, in, uh, in November. And it is that it was the 10th uh, conference of this kind. And we were proud to host live more than 100 um, uh, um, authors of papers, plus um, many, many, many more people in the audience. But without further ado, let's simply uh, start uh, discussing Karl Menger. Uh, as the, uh, at what we think is the father of the Austrian school, again with the hand, with the principles, 150 years old now. These days, the anniversary we have celebrated with many other works this year, but we'll continue to do so since, uh, and we will learn that from Mark Karl Menger, who was born in 1840 and passed away in 1922 definitely deserves to be one of the greatest economists who ever lived. And by the way, this year at Freedom Fest, we had a huge debate on who would be those four people who should deserve to be uh, also portrayed on Mount Rushmore. Uh, and Mark probably will tell you a little bit more later on. Uh, but without further ado, I simply hop on and give the word to Mark. Uh, Professor Skousen, the floor is yours. Uh, it shouldn't be... Uh, thank you, Barbara. And um, we should mention that uh, people can ask questions and we are going to uh, answer those questions after my presentation. This uh, session should last about an hour. And so uh, I hope you can all hear me okay. And I have a, a PowerPoint uh, as well as commentary as we move along uh, this session. Um, let me just uh, say that I am in Florida right now at my home in Florida, sunny Florida. Uh, I have in background a little bit of uh, music. My son-in-law is a musician. And um, I think that's appropriate because uh, I did want to start off by playing the uh, um, a, a little bit of music from Johann Strauss, The Emperor's Waltz. And when I teach a course in Austrian economics, uh, I start off with the Emperor's Waltz. And it's really fun because I ask the students when they listen to it, uh, if they can tell when the Emperor enters the room. And you can really tell listening to the Emperor's Waltz. Unfortunately, uh, there's all kinds of restrictions on how much of this sort of thing you can play. So uh, we, we won't start with the Austrian, uh, with the, uh, 
Emperor's Waltz, but uh, in many ways, I consider uh, Karl Menger the, the uh, emperor of economics who is entering the hall, and uh, we all stand to to honor him. And that's what we're doing uh, today in this session. And also, the uh, uh, Austrian Center had had this big conference last month that uh, I was unable to attend. Uh, but it was uh, apparently well attended, as as uh, Barbara indicated. Um, so uh, these are two photographs of Karl Menger, considered very distinguished, tall gentleman, um, and uh, one who I think deserves uh, accolades. Uh, we did have a uh, a uh, who who belongs on Mount Rushmore among top economists. And there was no consensus, but I certainly would put Carl Menger uh, up there along with uh, uh, Adam Smith. Uh, and uh, I also think a lot of Jean-Baptiste Say, Say's Law, if you want a French economist. And uh, among the Austrians, uh, Carl Menger, Mises and Hayek certainly fit into that category as well as Schumpeter and Bombarberg. There's, there's a lot of them who would qualify and then, of course, uh, among Americans, Milton Friedman would be one that would, would belong on uh, Mount Rushmore. So we may need more than four to honor them. And uh, Freedom Fest uh, in South Dakota was a very big success. And we are going to Las Vegas next year. Uh, if you're interested in attending, uh, those dates are uh, in July uh, 13th through the 16th at the uh, uh, in, in Las Vegas, and uh, you can get more information about that at freedomfest.com. So today, I want to talk about Karl Menger. It is the 150th anniversary of the establishment of the Austrian School of Economics that started with the publication of the Grundsatz, the Principles of Economics, as translated uh, by Karl Menger that came out in 1871. Uh, just in, in terms of an introduction, uh, I consider uh, Menger a revolutionary, and I put him at the top of theoretical economists. And here's the reason why. Uh, first of all, as you know, Adam Smith considered the founder of, uh, of modern economics, uh, but he, and, and his system of natural liberty is a, a beautiful edifice that has been built and Menger definitely wanted to build upon that model. He wanted to remodel it, but not tear it down. You know, you can divide economists uh, into two kinds. The, those who want to build upon and improve upon the Adam Smith system of natural liberty, which is what he called his economic model, and those who want to tear it down and, and build something else. Uh, Marxist, Keynesians fit into that category. So, um, uh, I, I would say that uh, it, it, what I tried to do in my book, The uh, Making of Modern Economics, is divide economists into those two camps. So I have a whole chapter on Menger. Uh, I call it Out of the Blue Danube, to have a little play on uh, words there. Uh, and my main point about Menger is that uh, he revolutionized both macroeconomics and microeconomics, and that's quite a feat. And I don't think there's any other economist who has achieved that level of uh, revolution in the economics profession. So I put him on the pinnacle, the top of all great economists. So if we have the next slide, you'll see uh, some interesting quotes, uh, what others say about Karl Menger. Uh, Newt Vixell said, no book since David Ricardo's principles have had such a great influence on the development of economics as the Grundsatz. And by the way, what's interesting about the Grundsatz is that uh, uh, it wasn't translated into English until 1950. And that was a great unfortunate tra tragedy in a lot of ways because uh, his influence could have been far, uh, far more uh, powerful if uh, they had translated that earlier. But as you know, um, uh, uh, Karl Menger uh, was a perfectionist. Uh, he thought there were serious flaws in his Grundsatz. Uh, I couldn't find any, but he seemed to think there were. So he never did want it to be reprinted. Uh, so uh, 
uh, I think that that would be an interesting uh, historical footnote. Uh, then we have Ludwig von Mises. It was the reading of his book, The Grundsatz, that made an economist out of me. Hayek said, I found it such a fascinating book, so satisfying. I would agree with that. It's a very satisfying book, and it's one you can read even today, and it's just so um, logical in its approach. And Sir John Hicks, who's uh, famous for his work on Keynesian economics, he says, "Now I now rate Valras and Pareto, who were my first love, so much lower than Menger. Uh, and then uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto, the Spanish economist, said, the entire theory of capital and cycles we have presented here rests on the, these this concepts of Menger. In short, Austrian school theorists have developed the whole theory of capital, money, and cycles which is implicit in the subjectivism that revolutionized economics in 1871. So that's quite a uh, tribute uh, to the great economist, uh, uh, Karl Menger, who is not normally listed. If you did a survey of all the great economists, uh, Menger is not listed uh, uh, in, uh, in the top three or four. You know, you have Marx and you have Keynes and and yeah, Friedman and uh, so forth. Uh, but uh, in my book, uh, Karl Menger is right there at the top. Uh, next slide. So here's the uh, book that he wrote uh, in German. I'm not going to try to pronounce the whole thing, but we just called it the Grundsatz. Uh, so the revolutionary treatise it had all, all three important vital elements of economics today, the correct view of microeconomics with the marginal subjective analysis and marginal analysis, the marginal revolution, but also a correct view of macroeconomics, the time structure of production, and a correct view of the origin and use of money, which he had a, a, it added as an appendix. And so that connect, you know, of course, money connects um, micro and macro. So uh, really is comprehensive and one must, uh, uh, pay tribute to, to the man who put this all together, and that was Carl Menger. Our next slide. It's a little bit of background on Carl Menger, born in 1840 in Poland. And, and in fact, what's kind of interesting is that uh, our, our Polish friends think that it shouldn't be the Austrian School of Economics, it should be the Polish School of Economics, because apparently uh, Ludwig von Mises was also born in uh, in a city that was uh, in Poland at the time. So uh, they're, they're uh, partial to the Polish school of economics. So if you have Menger and Mises there, of course, I think Vienna I, uh, was the uh, center of uh, all of the, uh, uh, the Austrian school. They ended up in, uh, in Vienna. Uh, Menger got law degrees at the University of Prague and Vienna and a doctorate at Krakow. Uh, in the 1860s, and this is, 1860 is very important when he became a journalist covering the stock market in Vienna. And it's actually there that he discovered that, uh, that uh, the uh, standard microeconomics, the theory of price, the price, price theory, as we call it, uh, was not based on cost of production. He noted that stocks varied according to the number of marginal buyers and sellers. And so he said, well, this doesn't fit at all into what I learned in basic economics. And so that became the source of his great discovery of the marginal revolution in the stock market. And I can really appeal to that since I'm a financial economist. In 1871, he published his magnum opus, The Grundsatz, and considered one of the three founders of the marginal revolution in economics, uh, Stanley Jevons and Leon Valras being the other two. 1873, uh, so look at this. He, he publishes this book in 1871, uh, and then in 1873, just two years later, he has made the University of Vienna chair of economic theory at the tender age of 33. So this guy is brilliant. And then just three years later, he becomes the tutor of the Archduke Rudolf von Habsburg, the crown prince of Austria, the only son, heir to the throne. And uh, that was uh, a remarkable event uh, that he would have that kind of influence. But unfortunately, uh, 
uh, some say, uh, in fact, uh, I think it's Mises who, who says that, uh, that, that, that uh, Rudolf, Rudolf uh, was turned a pessimist because uh, Menger was so pessimistic about the, uh, the empire, the Austro-Hungarian empire that uh, the Archduke Rudolf committed suicide. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what Mises, uh, uh, Mises states. And then in 1902, his only son, Carl, who became, becomes a mathematician, is born in Vienna. And he retires suddenly at 19, in 1903 at the age of 63. Some say it's related to the fact that uh, he had a uh, natural um, uh, unauthorized uh, uh, marriage or natural marriage, if you will, uh, to his housekeeper and uh Carl being the, uh, Carl with a K, uh, being the only son, and that was a bit of a scandal, so he retired. Uh, 1921, died at the age of 81 in Vienna, so um, he's uh, definitely a, lived a long time, unfortunately, uh, died rather pessimistic because of World War I, such a devastating experience and the destruction of uh, the Habsburg Empire. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he left a great legacy. Uh, next slide. So what I'd like to do is talk about the, the uh, three basic, the two or three basic influences that Menger had. And... Uh, and how I actually use Austrian economics, how I actually use Mengarian economics. You know, I was looking through my various books that I've written, the stru structure of production, structure of production, the, the, uh, the making of modern economics, which is my history of the great economic thinkers, uh, my, my textbook, economic logic, and Mengarian economics plays a significant role throughout this because he forms the foundation of, of micro and macroeconomics. So naturally, it would appear uh, to be a really significant factor in all of my writings. Uh, and let's just take the first example I like to use is uh, average real wages. And as you can see, uh, based on this chart that, that comes from the U.S., uh, according to this chart, average real wages, that is after you take account in, of inflation, has gone nowhere. It topped out in uh, the uh, 1970s and then drifted downward and now has moved back up to about the same level in 2019. So basically they're saying, yeah, we had 40 years of no improvement at all in the standard of living based on the average wages. Now, Average real wages is one of the ways in which um, economists measure progress. Uh, and it's totally misleading. It's just completely misleading if you look at just uh, average real wages over a time period. Because are we really saying that there's been no improvement in people's standard of living over the last 40 years? I asked my students this at Chapman University. And we go through lots of examples of quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services that people use. And everybody comes to a very different conclusion that we've made a vast improvement. So one thing I like about Menger in his general theory of the good, that he focuses on goods uh, and services, not just average wages. There's different ways of looking at standard of living. And I like that Menger focused on, uh, on goods rather than uh, uh, income and, and real income. I mean, how accurate is, uh, is the consumer price index uh, or the GDP deflator or what have you? These are macroeconomic models that don't do a very good job. So there is a whole sex, uh, area called complexity economics. And of course, because it's complex, it's a little bit harder to explain and when you look at individual goods and services, if you look at the quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services, you see a very different picture. So let's look at our next slide. So this is a little bit, uh, talk about complexity economics. Uh, the, uh, 
if we look at individual goods and services, and here we have uh, two dozen, uh, or maybe 20 different ways of looking at goods and services, electricity, telephone, dr uh, dryer, uh, internet, refrigerator, microwave, smartphone, radio, television, cell phone, video recordings, all, all of these kinds of things. And you'll notice that uh, since 1900, you're seeing a dramatic rise in the standard of living. And even since 1970, especially since 1970, remember real wages haven't changed at all. Average real wages, basically no change over the last 40 years. But you can see on this graph that more and more consumers are all benefiting for all these new products that are coming out. So this is where uh, we have to be very careful with how economists measure the standard of living. I think if you just have a huge macro one statistic, uh, you lose the, the variety of uh, how the standard of living is really measured. You've got to look at individual goods and products. You can't just look at, at income. Uh, you can't just look at, uh, uh, at, at an average wage. You have to look at benefits. You have to look at what you can use for those wages and so forth. Uh, so on the next slide. So we call this, as I teach this class, it's Q, Q, and V in Menger's Economics. So we have Eric Streisler, as he liked to say, he liked to really spell that, Streisler at the University of Vienna. He said, Mengerian goods are three-dimensional. They have quantity, quality, and variety as separate dimensions of dynamic change. I really like that. Now, yes, it's complex economics, but one of the... Um, uh, exercises I do with my students, I say, okay, over the last, since your lifetime, uh, what what goods and services are new and what have become obsolete? And they put on one side of the list all the new products, and then on the other side of the list, uh, on the paper, they put all the things that have become obsolete. And it's really a fun exercise. Of course, students are having a hard time figuring out what is obsolete. I have to tell them about the slide rule and things like that and, and VCRs, uh, uh, but they, they have kind of a vague notion of those kinds of things or Kodak cameras. <laughs> There's lots of, or the slide rule. I, I actually bring a slide rule into class and I say, now, have you ever seen this? And they, they have no idea what a slide rule is, but that's the dynamics. Uh, when you look at QQ and V, you see the dynamics of Mangarian economics. And then Lionel Robbins says, this business of conservation to meet future needs, according to Menger, involves four aspects of behavior, conservation of quantity, quality, choice, and choice as to secure the greatest results all around. So one of the exercises I do with my students, uh, this is very Mengerian. I say, okay, one of, I want one of your students to go into the largest uh, liquor store and find out how many different kinds of beer there are that are offered for sale in a large liquor store. And then I have another student go to the grocery store and find out how many different kinds of breads there are. And the results are always astonishing to, uh, to my, my uh, students. There's over a hundred different kinds of bread and there's over 500 different kinds of beers that are being offered. So QQ and V is a really fun exercise. Uh, all right, next slide. So example number two, prices are determined on the, by the margin. And this is a real shocker to a lot of people, especially when it comes to uh, uh, collectibles uh, or paintings or autographed baseballs, whatever you want to use uh, by uh, uh, people who have artists who have passed away. So their products are limited. So you have an, you have an el perfectly elastic supply curve. So Based on that, uh, I asked the question, is it possible for a product with limited supply and the artist has died, is it, is it true that the price can only go up? And it's a really good exercise uh, with the students because a lot of them say, well, yeah, the, uh, the demand curve, the supply curve is perfectly inelastic. 
so uh, as long if the demand keeps going up, then the then the price has to, has to go up. So in the next slide, you'll see that that's really not the case. That supply and demand is based on the current number of buyers and sellers, not the total supply of the product. And so you can see that uh, with this kind of a graph where actually the supply has not reached the point of, uh, of totally inelastic, uh, it can vary, can go up and down. And you see this all the time with collectibles. Collectibles don't just go up, they can also go down. And uh, if something becomes less popular, the demand can drop. But also if the price goes too high, people more come, available to supply the uh, the suppliers figure out it's time to time to sell so you can really have prices going higher going lower uh, prices are determined at the margin I use the example in my classroom of houses what what determines the price of housing it's obviously limited land is limited a number of homes are often limited in a certain community so does that mean prices of homes can only go up well, no, because demand can drop. And also, if the price is high enough, then you see a dramatic increase in the number of, uh, uh, of houses put on the market. Normally, one out of every 20 homes is, is available on the market. But what happens if suddenly uh, the neighborhood doesn't, uh, isn't as attractive as it used to be, so everybody's selling, so one out of 10 homes is now for sale? Well, guess what's going to happen to the price? it's going to drop pretty dramatically. So that's just another example. Uh, next slide. So the theory of imputation is a little bit hard to explain to, uh, uh, to students. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is interesting how uh, Roger Garrison, who's an Austrian, American economist uh, with strong Austrian background at uh, and, and he makes the point that, quote, the direction of causation was reversed by Menger. A consumption good is not valued because of the labor and other means of production that are used to produce it. Rather, the means of production are valued because of the prospective value of the consumption goods. So everything is driven by whether the consumer wants the product or not. You can spend all, you, all the money you want uh, producing a product, but if it doesn't sell, they may have to reduce. Very good point. <laughs> and we want to cover questions too, so we better move on. Thank you, Barbara, for that. Uh, are we getting questions? Anybody uh, sending in questions so far? Okay, well, maybe that's because I'm completely comprehensive and covering everything. All right, let's move on to our next example. Uh, now, this is uh, moving into um, actually microeconomics, but, but macro, uh, his macroeconomic model, which is the structure of production. And here we have four stages of production. I use wheat as, uh, as the production of bread as an example, where you start off with the raw commodity, and then it turns into flour, and then the wholesale, and then retail bread. And notice this four-stage model of the economy, you have... Um, uh, a uh, the value added at each stage. Notice each rectangle is getting larger. Uh, next uh, next slide. Uh, and here's an example taken from John Taylor's book in economics: the four stages of the producing producing exp espresso coffee, uh, and uh, how it starts off with the coffee grower. Then the uh, beans are roasted. Then they're shipped, uh, and then they produce the coffee, and it's shipped, and eventually you consume it uh, in a coffee shop. So you can see again four stages, value added at each stage. Next slide. So this is called the general theory of the good that uh, Menger emphasizes, uh, and I have a couple of quotes here. I particularly like the quote from Sir John Hicks. In Capital and Time, this was his Austrian uh, book that he, proto-Austrian book. He says, Menger's approach is the typical businessman's viewpoint. 
Nowadays, the accountant's viewpoint. In the old days, the merchant's viewpoint. What is that viewpoint? You're moving the production process along from the earliest stage of raw commodities to the final stage of a consumer use. And it goes through a variety of stages of production. That's not typically what's done in the economics textbooks, but it is done in my economics textbook, which is called Economic Logic. My, my textbook, Economic Logic, now in its fifth edition, is the first textbook to base micro, macro and microeconomics, but particularly the macroeconomics on a stages of production model. Uh, next slide. So this is an example of uh, bread. I think we already showed that. We can move on to the next slide. Uh, Hayek created these diagrams uh, in, in his book, Prices and Production, and it was highly theoretical. I think one of the drawbacks, one of the problems with Hayek is he only stayed with the theoretical model. What I've tried to do in, in advancing Hayekian economic, macroeconomics, which is basically based on Menger, uh, is the I actually put numbers to the uh, to the theory to the model, so you can see uh, how uh, this was confusing. A lot of Chicago economists complain how how difficult it was to understand Hayek's diagrams, but when you put actual numbers to it and a four stage model, which I do, it, it makes it makes more sense. Next slide. Uh, and this is Roger Garrison's uh, theoretical model, uh, again, of showing four stages of production. I keep it simple to five stages. He has mining and refining. Uh, I just put it into four simple stages. Next slide. So this is my model that I think students have a really good time understanding. So there's four stage, basic stages of production. There's the resource stage. Then a product is produced. Then it's distributed. And then it's consumed and final output. And notice number four is GDP. So you have the make economy, all the stages of production and value is added. And then you have the final use stage uh, of the consumer good. Next slide. And so Joseph Schumpeter did make this statement that uh, Mangarian economics really unified everything into a single concept, which uh, and what I like about it is my microeconomics and my macroeconomics are, uh, are not different. Uh, they're, they're both the same. You both have a four-stage model of the economy. Okay, next slide. I'm going to pass over. Let's, let's pass over these. These are just other people who have used their macroeconomics. Now, let's stop right there. Uh, yeah, this should be in, uh, in a uh, uh, mode where... <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think you, this is it, not the slide mode, right? I wanted to show what, what we do there. Can we do that in a slide mode? I guess not. Um, there's the four stages, mo huh? Uh, yeah, you need to, do you have a, can you do the four stage model in the slide mode? Okay. So, um, uh, what I try to show is that GDP is uh, is not the final key element of the economy. It doesn't measure total spending in the economy. It only measures final output. You can see that with stage number four. One, two, and three are not counted in GDP, but it's businesses uh, spending money, writing checks, all in stages one, two, and three, and they need to be counted. And next slide. So uh, who, who advanced uh, Mengarian macroeconomics, this is time stages of production? And the answer is Hayek, particularly in his prices and production, which created the, uh, what we call Hayek's triangles, what I call the four stages of production. Next slide. Uh, let's keep going on this one. I'll pass by this. We don't have time. Next slide. Okay, there was a great triumph. I mean, I had been promoting in my own book, The Structure of Production, uh, it, which came out in 1990, the argument that we are 
it's inappropriate to just measure GDP because that measures final output only, that it leaves out the earlier stages of production, the supply chain, leaves out the total supply chain. And we all have noted uh, this year in particular how the supply chain uh, is so vital to final output. So it needs to be measured. And uh, the big news was in April 2014, after uh, 14 years of pushing the government, the federal government to monitor, to measure the earlier stages of production, what we call gross output. They fa in fact did on never, I framed the uh, email that I got from the, uh, from the director of the BEA who said, we, we are now going to start measuring this on a quarterly basis. Steve Landefeld, who's quoted is, is there below. Uh, next slide. So here I am with uh, members of the BEA. Next slide. Uh, and I'll, I'll pass by this slide. It's a new definition of GDP based on it. Keep going. So Wall Street Journal has published three of my articles on this Mangarian view of the world. Uh, gross output is what I call the top line in national income accounting. Next slide. Uh, here's a quote from uh, these top economists saying gross output, GO, is the natural measure of the production sector, while net output, GDP, is appropriate as a measure of welfare. Both are required in a complete systems of accounts. Next slide. So most of you are familiar in accounting top line and bottom line in accounting. The top line is total revenue and expenditures. The bottom line is profits. And so now finally, we have a top line and a bottom line in economics. We've caught up with the accounting and finance professions finally in the 21st century. It took us that long. And the top line is uh, gross output. It's measuring total spending in the economy. While the bottom line is uh, final output, uh, finished goods and services. So we have a top line and a bottom line in national income accounting. Next slide. So this is for those of you who are unfamiliar with accounting, you have a top line and a bottom line in, in income statements that are released every quarter by uh, companies that are publicly traded. And uh, we, now do the, we now can do the same thing. This is all Mangarian. And Menger was originally the, uh, and Hayek, those are the two big uh, key factors. And there's no question that we stand on the shoulders of giants, don't we, in producing these things. So my book, The Structure of Production, which uh, is uh, this book right here, The Structure of Production, was my advancing uh, the macro, uh, the, the Mengarian vision and actually putting numbers to it, which is really critical because nobody did this up until uh, – uh, the my book, the structure of production. We didn't put numbers to it. It's just like it's just like uh, uh, Milton Friedman. Uh, Milton Friedman, Anna Schwartz, in their 1963 uh, book on uh, on monetary history of the United States. Nobody nobody aggregated uh, the money supply. M1 and M2 didn't exist until uh, uh, Friedman and Schwartz uh, brought that out in their book, A Monetary Theory. And so I've tried to do the same thing with Mangarian macroeconomics to actually put numbers on it. Next slide. So uh, what do we learn from this gross output, uh, this top line, bottom line? Well, first of all, one thing that you learn is that business spending is much bigger than consumer spending. It's a myth to say that consumer spending represents 70% of the economy, of economic activity. It's 70% of GDP, but remember GDP leaves out all the expenditures in the earlier stages of production. Uh, it leaves out the supply chain. When you add it in, it turns out that business spending, uh, gross investment is around 61% of the economy. Consumer spending is still important, but it's less than a third, not two thirds, less than a third. And government spending is only around 8%. So that's a, dr the models change. Next slide. You can see that here, the GDP model shows consumption as the key to uh, prosperity. And we demonstrate, as Say's law indicates, 
that consumption is the effect, not the cause of prosperity. So in the GO model, which is the uh, Mangarian model, you see that gross uh, business spending is by far the biggest uh, elephant in the room and personal consumption uh, is second, government expenditures is third. So it's a rather dramatic change. Next slide. So what can we learn using gross output? We see the business spending is substantially larger and more volatile than uh, consumer spending. And that's predicted in uh, both Hayek and Menger's work that the further removed you are from final use, the more volatile the market is uh, because of inventories and uh, interest rates and uh, the labor intensity and so forth. Okay, so you can see here in this chart, the green line is substantially larger. The, the business spending is substantially larger and more volatile than the red line, which is consumer spending. Consumer spending is pretty boring, doesn't a lot of have a lot of change, except uh, during the pandemic of last year, you saw uh, a dramatic drop off in consumption primarily, but that was because of the lockdown and then it recovered very quickly. And you can see the supply chain has recovered very quickly also, even with the shortages that they're talking about. Next slide. So this is a great quote from Larry Kudlow. He says, no, not at one in a thousand recognizes it. It is business, not consumers, that is the heart of the economy. When businesses produce profitably, they create income paying jobs and then consumers spend. So see, there's a pattern there. Profitable firms also purchase new equipment because they need to modernize and update all their tools, structures, and software. This is a great quote from Larry Kudlow. But unfortunately, even today, we still live under the Keynesian model of GDP, and they ignore the supply chain, and that's a, that's a fatal flaw in current macroeconomics. So one of the things I do in my textbook, Economic Logic, it's the first textbook that actually integrates gross output, the top line in national income accounting, Mangarian, the Mangarian breakthrough uh, in economics. And by the way, I have shown a number of uh, my books here. And if people are interested in, in uh, getting more information and buying my, my books at a discount, uh, they should go to skousenbooks.com, S-K-O-U-S-E-N, skousenbooks.com and they can get any of my books at a discount. Next slide. So what do we learn? First of all, gross output, the top line in national income accounting, the Mangarian top line in national income accounting is a better, more comprehensive measure of the ups and downs of the economy and confirms the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Uh, Mises and Hayek developed this Austrian theory of the business cycle and you can see the green line it much reflects much better the depth of the business cycle. Uh, if you look just at GDP, the red line, you can see there isn't a lot of change there, but you see a rather dramatic change in gross output. So gross output is much more volatile. It's much bigger because it includes all the stages of production. And people's biggest criticism of GO is not just double counting. And of course, the answer is it is double counting, but double counting counts because the product is being changed, it's being moved, it's being transferred, it's moving along the process, the finished product uh, through the stages of production. And the more information we know about the stages of production, the better off we are. So GO is double counting, but it's extremely important. Uh, critical element to count when we're looking at the total economic behavior and actual businesses writing checks. Uh, next slide. So this shows you the difference in uh, incredible volatility between GO and GDP. As you can see, GO is much more volatile than GDP. Uh, these statistics have been available since 2005 and it shows a real dramatic difference. Uh, so the green line is a much better indicator of uh, gross gross output is the way uh, or uh, indicator of the business cycle than GDP itself. Next slide. Uh, the missing link in economics between micro and macro. So here's our micro model showing coffee production. 
Notice four stages of production. Notice you add value at each stage of production. And then the macro model, next slide. You can see I've, I've, re, I've turned the ordinances here, but uh, you can still see the same thing. The macro model, four stages, value added uh, in, in general terms. Stage one is resources, raw commodities. Number two is production. Number three, distribution. Number four is final output. And what I like about it is you can see how GO, which is a measure of all four stages of production, can be shown linked with GDP. So the really cool thing about GO is you don't have to completely redo the textbooks. All you need to do is add GO as the top line to the way national income accounting is taught and uh, it, they are linked together. So it's, 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 not, it's not like you have to throw out all of standard economics in order to, in order to come up with the Mengarian Austrian uh, textbooks, uh, it can be integrated into standard economic model, and that's what I've that's what I've done with with my uh, economic logic textbook. So you might want to take a look at that. Uh, next slide. So this shows you uh, compares gross output with GDP. As you can see, gross output is pretty dramatic, and in fact. Uh, I should show you my, this is my investment newsletter. And I don't know if you can see the headline here, but it says the $50 trillion bubble economy. This is the very first year, 2021, when gross output actually hit $50 trillion, $50 trillion economy in terms of total spending in the economy. GDP itself is around $22 trillion, but gross output total spending in the economy actually hit the $50 trillion level in, in the economy. So it deserved a highlight in my newsletter. Uh, next slide. Confirm Say's Law. So uh, Say's Law is extremely important. Supply creates its demand. The supply of X create the sale of X creates the demand for Y is really what, what, uh, what it confirms. Supply does create demand, according to this uh, this this uh, Mengarian model. Next slide. So this is a general model of the economy. I'll move along to the next slide. Uh, so these are just some of the factors. I think if any of you wants these slides, because we've gone through them pretty quickly, uh, I think it's possible perhaps... Uh, uh, Barbara, you can uh, you can email those to anybody who who requests them. But we want to look at the total structure of the economy. So, Mengarian economics is really valuable because it's not just it, it de, uh, disaggregates the economy, and so you look at more of what's happening within the economy rather than as as a whole. So you don't just look at the rate of unemployment; you look at the structure of employment and unemployment. Stock indexes, you look at the S&P 500, but then you look at various sectors of the economy, which are more volatile. So there, there's a lot of fodder here for, uh, for research and further work that, that is being done in this whole area of the structure of the time structure of the economy, which is a Mengarian vision. Uh, next slide. So these are just some of the textbooks, including my own, that are now introducing gross output. And uh, McConnell Brew is one that that's the largest, biggest selling textbook. And it now includes a brief mention of gross output. But I see a time within the next 10 years that gross output as the top line and in national income accounting will be included in, in all the textbooks. Next slide. How are we doing on questions? Anybody? Uh, uh, asking any questions? Okay. Well, these are my conclusions. Uh, we'll just leave them up there. Why don't we uh, take some questions since we only have about five more minutes? See, I can't hear you, Barbara. Apologies, I, I just had to one minor mistake. Well, thank you very much uh, for for your 
um, uh, for your talk and for reaching out to uh, bringing bringing our Austrian and European uh, audience to um, to the gross output idea because this is definitely not discussed only in our circles in the US but not on, on, on this side of the pond. Um, you mentioned a couple of things. One of them was uh, truly important. Uh, you mentioned money connects micro and macro. And I just would like to say that also um, Karl Menger already discussed modern monetary theory back then, and we could go into depth on another different uh, on a different um, set panel on that. But I would just go to the questions right now. So I have Tomas who wants who asks, what in your opinion is the most effect, uh, effective way to measure and assess economic output if GDP covers only the final product? I mean, you already mentioned that, uh, but maybe you could go again a little bit more into depth uh, with regards of measuring. One of the things that uh, the BEA does, the government, uh, can, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, is that uh, they break it down, they, they uh, 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 disaggregate, if you will, the different uh, price indexes uh, and output indexes. So you get to see what sectors of the economy are growing faster than others. Uh, and they put numbers to all of them. And they're always trying to update the numbers and improving their ability to uh, figure these out. This is the BEA Bureau of Economic Analysis. Uh, BEA.gov is the website. And uh, I also do, uh, whenever they come out with a new quarterly statistic, I break it down and I, I so if people, I actually do have a, um, a website devoted to gross output. It's called grossoutput.com. So it's really easy to remember. And if you go there, you'll look at my quarterly uh, report that comes out with GDP every quarter. So you can see what the differences are between final output and the different um, stages of production and so forth. Thank you. Another question by Ruben. He asks, under this perspective, how can you explain the financial crisis? I mean, he didn't mention which one, but uh, let's go. Let's assume the, the the big financial crisis and the and what we see these days. Well, uh, I think the best um, Austrian. Uh, uh, example is the 2008 financial crisis because that's where housing and construction got way uh, out of whack uh, and that was based on uh, easy money, low interest rates, uh, poor standards, you know they had the subprime loan uh, crisis and so forth. So you can see the boom bust cycle being developed out of that and the statistics are quite clear that uh, the economy rose, the gross output grew faster, dramatically faster than final output. And that was an indication that we were getting a little bit out of whack. And uh, so um, that, that would be an example where you look at GO and compare it to GDP and you see which one's growing faster. And, and if it's not, uh, not, um, uh historically in line then you're headed for trouble well uh ruben just mentioned that he uh wrote that he meant the 206 208 crisis but uh eventually it's always the boom and bust cycles uh, that we see these days um there is another uh, remark by mugabe and he says teaching Karl Menger in african universities is much needed um, and I think, uh, Mark, you're always reaching out to everybody and you're a perfect uh, marketeer and sa salesperson of the, not only the Austrian school, but all, of all your books and products. So I'm sure that um, we can do something for our friends um, in, in Africa as well. Yes, I would be glad to help. Oh, go ahead. Okay, wonderful. Um, I would say since uh, we have 30 seconds left, I mean, this is kind of uh, a little bit too short for you, but I would 
simply say thank you very much, Professor Skousen. Thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, discussion and for also discussing Menga with us and bringing your ideas, connecting, connecting the dots between what happened 150 years ago and what is happening these days uh, to our audience and for pro providing this lecture. Again, I can only recommend uh, to join our Free Market Roadshow, our events, the Freedom Fest, and uh, look at all our publications and websites. It's been a pleasure to have you. And we're looking forward to the next opportunity to discuss uh, maybe the modern, modern monetary theory under the perspective of Menger. I just give you the note. Uh, he was disputing with, Karl, uh, with Georg Friedrich Knapp uh, in 1905. And uh, back then, uh, Knapp exactly used the same arguments that MMT is uh, using now. So I think there is a big front that the two of us can, can work on.